and welcome to GameShack. Sega somewhat recently announced that they're going to put an end to the Sega Ages series line of games that they've been producing for a long, long time now. So I figured I'd do a little bit of a retrospective of all the releases in the series. Today I'm going to focus on the ones that were made for the Sega Saturn since that's basically where the series started. And no, don't worry, I'm not going to make a bunch of Sega Ages themed episodes back to back all in a row. That might be a little bit too much. Anyway, there were 13 games released on the Sega Ages series on the Saturn, so let's just get right into it. The first volume of Sega Ages on the Saturn is Yukudai Ga Tant R. Like all but three of the games in the Sega Ages series on the Saturn, this one was only released in Japan. You can choose from two games, the first being Puzzle in Action, Tant R. This is all in Japanese, but you can figure out most of it without knowing the language through a bit of trial and error. Basically, it's full of mini games that you choose, like following which hat the flower is in. Can you keep track? Or this one where you need to add and subtract shapes to get the result while the timer ticks down. Kind of reminds me of IQ tests or something. The timer adds quite a bit of pressure. Or how about this one where you need to choose the series of numbers that's quickly flashing by. It took me a few tries to figure out what the hell I was even supposed to do, but after that it was easy because I have eyeballs. There are plenty of other mini games to play on here as well. Between stages you get a bonus game where you grab some money bags. Honestly, I've got to say that I really kind of enjoyed this one. The other game on here is Quiz Sayukudai Wo Mwashumaru Shi, I don't know. This one will be completely useless to anyone except for people who can read Japanese. Even if you do though, it seems kind of boring unless you like being quizzed. If you're going to get this, Tant R is where you're going to be spending your time. Welcome to the family. Get ready. Volume 2 is Space Harrier, one of my favorite arcade games back in the day. This one is pretty simple to describe. You're automatically flying forward, shooting everything you see and defeating the bosses at the end of each stage. Not everything can be destroyed though, so watch out. Stages 5 and 11 are bonus stages where you ride on a fuzzy dragon just like the never ending story and collect some cool bonus points. To me, this game is still extremely fun to play. This version is actually the first time we got an arcade perfect port at home. The 32X version is actually really close, however it's slightly cropped resulting in some letterboxing and it usually runs at a lower variable frame rate and it has lots of slowdown. Here you get the full 60 frames per second and full screen gameplay. You can also play with analog controls like the mission stick which I highly recommend. Other than that there really aren't any additions here other than some basic options. I don't want to talk about Space Harrier too much because I've talked about the series so much in the past, but let's just say that I approve of this one. Run is next on Volume 3, another amazing Sega arcade game that needs very little introduction. You're racing against the clock and only the clock. At the end of each stage, you can choose to turn left or right, each leading to a different area. This adds a lot of replayability. This game is just so fun and I can't recommend it enough. However, there are some additions here which make this the best port of the original Outrun ever made. For one, you get to choose between the Japanese and overseas layout. Remember how awkwardly the stages were stitched together in the Genesis version? That was the Japan layout. This one lets you choose both because it's awesome. Choices are good. And of course you get to choose between the three original arcade music tracks, each of which are incredible. Not only that, but you can set the music to the arranged mode. Suddenly you have CD quality tracks arranged by the original composer Hero just for this game. No other port of OutRun out there has this option. But wait, there's more! 
If you go into the options screen, hold the A and C buttons on the game mode selection and then press left or right, you can access the smooth mode. You only need to do this once as it will save it into your Saturn's memory. The smooth mode is a full 60 frames per second experience. That's right, a better frame rate than the arcade. It kind of feels slow for some reason at first, but it's still super fun. So there you have it. This disc is the best version of the original OutRun you can get anywhere, bar none. Or is it? We'll have to check out the Switch version in a future Sega Ages episode. Will we all be saying Nintendo is what Genesis isn't? No, because this is the Saturn. Stay tuned. Sega was off to a really strong start with the series, and the future looked promising for it. And they did stay strong. For a little while, anyway. Volume 4 brought us Afterburner 2. When the arcade came out, it was such an incredible experience that was hard, if not impossible, to fully replicate. This game is obviously inspired by Top Gun. You're flying your F-14 to destroy everyone else in the skies because they can just go straight to hell. You can shoot them down with your Vulcan gun if you're close enough, but if your reticle touches an enemy on screen, then you'll be locked on. The voice will tell you to fire and your missile is guaranteed to make sure their family never sees them again. That's okay though, they were evil. They're from a different country after all. At least I think so, you don't seem to be very discriminating during your flight. Every once in a while, a fuel tanker will refuel your jet and restock your missile so you can bring even more death because you don't like it when things are alive. If that's not enough, sometimes you'll even be able to land and get restocked by a team of people who feel the same way about everyone else that you do. <laughs> you think you can outrun me? Eat my thrust, loser! There are even bonus stages where you attack innocent people who are just there camping out, trying to enjoy their lives. But you do not approve, not one bit. I mean, they're probably camping illegally anyway. It doesn't matter though, because you are a bastard. Anyway, this game is super fun. Like Space Harrier and even OutRun, this is also the first time this game made it home 100% intact, at least as far as the graphics, sound, and control are concerned. Again, the 32X version is close, but it runs at half the frame rate and it has much blockier scaling. Playing with the Saturn mission stick is absolute perfection, though it doesn't shake like the arcade version does when you crash. All of the sound really adds to the experience. The music by Hero is amazing, but there's no arranged versions here, sadly. Still, this one is lots of fun. North America and Europe got Sega Ages Volume 1, which has Space Harrier, OutRun, and Afterburner 2 all on one disc. Can you believe that? Three games on a single disc? The technology to do this must be incredible. It was released by Working Designs in North America under the SPAS label, which might offend Australians. And maybe a few other countries, I honestly don't know. Bam. Sadly, they got rid of all of the arranged music in OutRun, but other than that, everything is here. Yep, even the 60 frames per second mode in OutRun made it. This one goes for quite a bit of money secondhand these days. The European version is much cheaper. Unfortunately, there was never a volume two of these compilations released. <laughs> volume five is Rauka ni Ichidant dash R. Yeah. Anyway, this is similar to Tant R, just with all new minigames. I'll be honest, I couldn't really get into this one as much after playing Tant R so recently, I wasn't really in the mood for more of this. Still, there are some good minigames here, like trying to find the pieces of the rocket so it can launch. There's also this one where you're supposed to find Dracula behind one of the doors, but I honestly have no clue whatsoever on how to look for him. I just open a door randomly. There's another quiz game on the disc as well if you love being quizzed in Japanese. 
They did improve the graphics of this one over the first, though. The minigame side of this disc is decent, I guess, but I think I prefer Tant R, or Tant Dash R. Here's Fantasy Zone, which is Volume 7. This one was released to the arcades in 1986. You play as a sentient spaceship named Opa Opa. You fly back and forth across a looping stage, avoiding enemies with seemingly random and completely unpredictable patterns. I mean, these patterns are crazy. They can be really tough to avoid. Your mission is to destroy all of the bases which are creating these enemies, kind of like Gauntlet. Anyone remember Gauntlet? Anyone at all? Well, I remember Gauntlet. After all of the bases are destroyed, get this, you fight a boss. What will games think of next? Sometimes you can go to a shop and buy speed increases, better weapons or bombs, or even extra lives. But each item gets more and more expensive each time you buy it. And let's not forget that the weapons are on a timer. I've never seen this game in an arcade, but I did get to play the actual arcade PCB way back in episode 19. It's a good game with crazy pastel graphics and great music by renowned Sega composer Hero. The version on the Saturn is pretty much a bare bones presentation of the arcade, but you do have a few decent options. You can change the difficulty level and you can change the country. Now, from what I understand, the music in a couple of the levels is a bit different between the US and Japan. Sadly, there's no option for rapid fire at all. You can watch examples of professional gamers playing through the entire game. You can even record your own play and save it to the external RAM cartridge and watch it later. Be careful though, because it can take up nearly half of the available space. When you watch the gameplay back, there are no sound effects and you listen to the only arranged music in the game, which loops every few minutes. All in all, this is a great disc if you like Fantasy Zone. Here's Volume 8, which is Memorial Selection Volume 1. That's right, two volumes in a single title. This one has four of Sega's absolutely ancient games. I never saw any of these in any arcade, ever. If I did, I walked right by them because they didn't look very interesting. The first game is called Head On. Screw this game. The goal is simple, drive around trying to collect all of the dots. Meanwhile, the red car is driving around trying to smash into you in a head-on collision. And trust me, he'll succeed. On the open parts of the track, you can switch lanes, and you need to try to be in a lane that the red car can't get into. But the red car reacts super fast, so you are gonna die. Despite how much I hate this game, I kept trying again and again and again. However, I was never able to get all of the dots in the first round. This one's tough, I tell you. Then there's Pango. You're a penguin, and your goal is to defeat all of the enemies by shoving bricks into them. If you're not fast enough, more and more enemies keep generating. Kind of like Gauntlet. Anyone remember Gauntlet? Actually, it's not like Gauntlet at all. I couldn't get into this one very much. Next is Up and Down, where you pilot a car on his mission to collect all of the different colored flags on the track. Once a color has been grabbed, it turns white. You can jump over enemies to kill them, but be careful because it's really easy to jump off of the track and then die. I have to admit, I got a little bit of enjoyment out of this one, even though I totally suck at it. The final game on this disc is Flicky, which is on almost every Sega compilation ever. You're the blue bird, and you need to grab all of your yellow chicks that are scattered about the stage and take them to the exit. The stage loops as you scroll left or right. However, cats are running around the stage, and if you have a chicken toe, they'll stop following you if a cat touches it. You can throw things at a cat to murder it to buy some time, but more cats will always appear. Get all of the chicks to the exit to clear the stage. The more chicks you have when you touch the exit door, the higher score you'll get. Flicky is okay for a few minutes, but I usually get bored of it fairly quickly. All of these games have options which include a sound test, and some of them have a game mode A and a game mode B. And game mode B is, you guessed it, but other than that, it's pretty bare bones, just like the games themselves.
There's been a fair amount of variety in what Sega's been releasing in the series so far, and while I'm certainly disappointed that we haven't seen Hang On or Enduro Racers by this point, at least we get a disc that has a whole bunch of Columns games on it that more than makes up for it. Actually, no it doesn't. Columns Arcade Collection shows up as Volume 8. As you may have probably already have guessed, this one has four arcade versions of Columns on it. I don't really like games like this very much, but I've always had a minor soft spot for Columns. Your goal is to match three colors horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. All of the shapes consist of three vertical blocks, but you can't rotate them. However, you can swap the order of the colors. The first Columns game is still my favorite, though I prefer the Genesis version because that one has a little bit better sound quality. Each game has options which will show you how many jewels you've cleared since you purchased the game and it looks like there may be some extra options to unlock. Pretty cool. This is the first time Columns 2 was ever playable at home. This one seems like a big downgrade in graphics and sound. Here I'm trying to get to and eliminate the flashing jewel or shape. If you like Columns, then I think you might appreciate the challenges that this one offers. Stack Columns kind of reminds me of Puyo Puyo in that you're battling an opponent. And this isn't just for fun either. You can tell by the gun that this game is serious frickin' business. Don't mess with me when it comes to Columns or I'm gonna start busting taps! The final game on here is Columns 97 and oh my god my eyeballs! Yikes, turn down the saturation a little please. This is just a fancy upgrade of the original Columns, basically. Honestly, it doesn't do the game any favors as I'd still rather look at and listen to the original game. Plus, the pieces on this one drop way too fast early on. Still, if you're a big Columns fan or games like this, then this is definitely a disc that you'll enjoy. Once Volume 9 came around, we got Memorial Selection Volume 2. This would be the final Memorial Selection released, and there are six games here. The first is simply called Samurai. You stiffly control a samurai wandering around an area trying to kill all of the other samurais. You can kill and be killed with one hit. You even have to deal with someone throwing stars at you from above, a grappling hook from below, and if you get too close to the sides, they'll try to poke at you if there are people there. Now this game sounds like it's horrible, right? No, I actually really enjoy it for what it is. The controls are primitive, but they work. What can I say? I think people should try this one. Next up is Monaco GP. Here you race straight ahead and just try to go as far as you can, obtaining the highest score possible. The enemy racers are all clearly drunk, but somehow you're the only one that ever spins out from a collision. Also, for some reason, the sides of the road keep moving in and out, towards and away from each other. Maybe I'm the one that's drunk? Or maybe I'm racing during a very strange earthquake, or perhaps on some sort of net that's tethered between two boats? I have no idea why this is happening. There are no turns in the game, and it's fun for a minute or two. But every time I see this on a Sega collection, I just wish that they had brought the arcade version of Super Monaco GP home instead. Then there's Starjacker. This vertical shooter starts you with a bunch of ships, all flying and firing weapons at the same time. If you take a hit, one of your ships goes away and you have slightly less firepower. However, when there's only one ship left, it's much easier to avoid all of the enemy fire. But when that ship finally gets hit, and it will, it's game over. It's kind of an interesting concept.
Next is Sinbad Mystery. Your goal is to collect all of the question marks which reveals a treasure map over on the right. You can dig holes to block enemies and you can fill them back in again as well. It's pretty tough. Once you get all of the question marks, a treasure box appears for you to collect and then you win the stage. I really didn't get a whole lot out of this one myself, but I don't hate it or anything. Here's Penguin Land, which seems to be the SG-1000 version. I've got to admit, I've never, ever cared for this game despite trying it tons of different times. Your goal is to roll the egg down to the bottom without breaking it. But each time I give this game a try, I want to turn it off immediately. Some people really love it, and I honestly can't understand why. But hey, it's here for you if you enjoy it. Just because you like it doesn't mean I have to. The last game on here is the best, and it's called Ninja Princess. You play as a ninja princess trying her best to get to the opposite end of the stage. There are three buttons. One attacks in the direction that you're facing, another attacks straight up, which is more handy than you might think, and the third button makes you disappear briefly in order to avoid attacks. Even with all these attacks, the game is still pretty tough, but it's also really fun. This one would later be remade into the Ninja on the Sega Master System, which is even better. Overall, this is a fairly good disc for the Saturn. Volume 10 is the kart racing game called Power Drift. This is a game that I can't decide if I like it or not. I mean, generally I have fun playing it, but it looks so incredibly sloppy and amateur when it comes to the visuals, even for the time period it was released in, because I thought these same things back then. Anyway, you choose a course in a car and off you go. This isn't what you'd expect from a kart racer. There are no weapons or anything like that. It's straight up racing and nothing more. So I don't really consider this game to be in the same genre as Mario Kart. Not even close, really. You make your way around a super short track for four laps. You want to finish in the top three or it's game over for you. It can be pretty tough because the tracks are super narrow. That means it's easy to fall off of the edge. Sometimes if there's a barrier, you'll pinball back and forth, which is the exact opposite of having fun. Still, the game is really fast paced and it's enjoyable once you get used to it. There's also a Grand Prix mode. Here, whatever place you finish in is where you'll start the next race. It also means that a fourth place finish isn't necessarily a disqualifier for advancement. The graphics are where I have my big issues. Everything is assembled with rough looking horizontal 2D logs, but the game tries to take place in a full 3D space. So no matter what direction the camera's facing, the front of the logs are always facing directly towards you. Like I said, it just looks sloppy, especially during the stage introductions. It also looks pretty bad if you crash and roll. Yikes. But I like how fast everything scales, even if the Saturn version here only moves at half the frame rate of the arcade. The colors are also really nice, and I like how many different tracks there are to race on. And of course, the music by Hero is great as always. If you change the BGM Select to on in the options menu, you'll be able to select your music as you start the game. Many of the tracks selectable are super arranged by Hero himself. I think that once you get used to it, this game is worth owning. I guess maybe that's why I own it. We're down to the final three releases in the Sega Ages series on the Saturn. Is it gonna go out with a bang or a whimper? It's gotta be one extreme or the other. You can't just have it going out on a, you know, moderately well or something. That doesn't get the clicks. Anyway, let's take a look at these final three games.
When I saw Volume 11, which is Fantasy Star Collection on a local store when it was released, I picked it up right away. For some reason, I felt that I had to. I knew I wouldn't be able to play the game very much since it was all in Japanese, but I paid the $70 or whatever it was anyway. I should not be trusted with money. But I still have it. This one has four of Sega's best RPGs, the Fantasy Star games. The real ones, the ones that are actually RPGs. Unfortunately, Fantasy Star Gaiden for the Game Gear isn't here, but I don't really miss it. It would be nice to have for completeness, however. A couple of the games have a choice between hiragana and katakana style text. Hell yes! Fantasy Star 1 is presented in a window with a border since the Master System resolution is so low. It looks perhaps a bit desaturated and of course a bit squished due to being shoved into a more squarish pixel aspect ratio. The audio features the FM soundtrack and this is the first time I had ever heard the game this way. It was really strange and it took a long, long time for me to actually like it. I still prefer the PSG music for this particular game though. It feels like it has more character. The games from the Mega Drive are presented in full screen without a border and they look great. Fantasy Star 2 has the super loud percussion that infected the Japanese version of that game. It sounds really bad and it gets annoying to listen to after only a few minutes, much like myself. I am so glad that they fixed that for the international release. Fantasy Star 3 has characters that move way faster than the original game. Maybe I accidentally selected it to move this way, but honestly I kind of like it. Fantasy Star 4 is even on here and it often gets omitted from these kinds of collections, maybe because it's too big, I don't know. Sadly, the Saturn is far too weak for this game as it needs to load the battle sequences sometimes. There's also some bonus content like the Japanese TV ads for each game. Not only that, but there are some high resolution images of characters and sometimes even design sheets for all the games. Who wouldn't want to see the awesome enemy called Dark Phallus? You even get to listen to some cool Saturn chip tunes as you browse these that are excellent arrangements of the music from each game. The game comes packed with a rather thick instruction book as well as some maps for each title. Pretty impressive for the time. This is a great collection and I really wish that they had released it in English. Volume 12 is Galaxy Force 2, which is a third-person shooter like Space Harrier or Afterburner. However, in this one, you're flying a cool spaceship and you're trying to bring peace to the entire galaxy, which consists of five planets and a final area after that. Now that is a big galaxy. You start outside, flying around and destroying things. Eventually, you'll fly into a tunnel and have to deal with various bad guys and whatnot inside there. You'll also have to navigate some tight turns here and there. At the end of the tunnel is usually a boss who may require up to four or five hits to destroy. Basically, if you're pressing the fire buttons, he's gonna die no matter what. Pretty easy. The game controls similar to Afterburner in that you have a regular gun as well as missiles that you can fire after you lock onto a target. You have unlimited missiles here though. One thing that's not unlimited is your energy. It's always ticking down in the bottom right of the screen. If you get hit by enemy fire or bump into a wall, it decreases even more. You can get energy back in some stages that have more than one tunnel to fly through. This is really the game's only challenge, because if you run out of energy, you die and it's game over. You can play this with the Saturn mission stick, but since the game moves a lot slower than Afterburner and Space Harrier, I kind of felt my hand cramping up a bit trying to maintain some finesse with the stick. The graphics are incredible for their time, and they still impress me today. The only sad thing here, though, is that they updated half of the arcade's 60 frames per second. It still looks good. The music is also pretty good with lots of slap bass. 
Like Fantasy Zone, this one allows you to save a replay of your game and watch it again some other day. Also like Fantasy Zone, you can watch the game play itself to completion. Take that, Nintendo, in your white tanuki suit. Sega will beat the entire game for you. Overall, this isn't quite a classic like Space Harrier, Outrun, or Afterburner, but it's still an impressive game that's fairly fun every once in a while. Finally, Volume 3 was the last Sega Ages release on the Saturn, and it was I Love Mickey Mouse and I Love Donald Duck. I don't know about you, but I don't love either of those characters. I love the games on this disc, though, at least Castle of Illusion. I always felt Mickey Mouse has been kind of a lame character. I'm definitely more of a Bugs Bunny guy and Tom and Jerry. Gotta be honest, Disney cartoons just weren't as funny. Anyway, this disc has two Genesis Disney games, Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse and Quackshot starring Donald Duck. And basically, that's it. The games here play fine, though all of the text is in Japanese. Nothing has been added or enhanced in any way. There's no bonus content at all outside of some arranged menu music. I would have liked it if, at the very least, each game offered a cool CD-quality soundtrack as you played. You don't unlock anything when you beat either of the games. It's very bare bones. I imagine Sega just wanted to give players a chance to play these two games since the Mega Drive didn't do anywhere near as well as the Saturn did in Japan. Don't get me wrong, these games are great, I just wish they could have offered a bit more here. There we go, Sega Ages on the Saturn. Overall, I feel it was a fairly decent lineup of games, though I would have loved to see some releases like Thunderblade and Super Hang On. I don't even think Sega realized back then how much people love Super Hang On, and they really do love it. But hey, we got Flicky, what more could you need? Anyway, I'll be back in the future to cover the Sega Ages series on the PlayStation 2, and that is gonna be a hell of an episode to make. Anyway, what do you think of Sega Ages on the Saturn? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Hello and welcome to this very special edition of GameSack where we're going to take a look at some rare gaming artifacts from around the world. In fact, on loan today from the world-renowned Video Game Museum in Tokyo, Japan is this special one-of-a-kind Virtual Boy that was signed by the inventor of Nintendo, Shigeru Miyamoto. That's not the only thing that makes this Virtual Boy special though. In fact, it's the only one that can... One moment. Hey Siri? Uh-huh? I broke a priceless one-of-a-kind item. What do? Just use Gorilla Glue. I don't own a gorilla that I can extract glue from. What do now? Then lie about it to protect your clumsy ass, you stupid dumb idiot. So yeah, it turns out that the guy who signed that, he wasn't anyone special. No one knows who he is. It, it doesn't really matter. Museums are kind of stupid anyway. Don't quit your day job. Do you even have a day job?